So we've been in this series um, looking at, um, for lack of a better word, what are the harbor values? What do we call central to our identity um, here at the Harbor Church? Um, since it's been about four years since we set out on this journey, and it might be time to revisit and relook and rethink who we are, who God has called us to be, and where we're going. Um, so the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about um, how God sends us out into the world, both to our unavoidable world, our friends, our family, um, our colleagues, our work people, but also how God sends us to the avoidable world, the places we would rather not go. Um, and today, we're going to look at a harbor value that I guess I consider pretty central to who we are, pretty central to... Um, what we're about. And I'm surprised that it took us this long to get to it, but today we're going to talk about prayer. And we it's the one thing that we do, the one thing that we start to do, and we continue to do today. We, bring, we come to the Lord, and we offer up our concerns, our worries, and our prayers. Um, so if you have your Bibles, you can turn to me to um, Psalm 130, and it'll be our text for today. And it reads, Out of the depths, I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand but with you? There is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in this word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Will you pray with me? So Lord, as we dive into your word this morning, we pray that you will open our ears and open our eyes we pray your spirit will descend upon us and speak to us truth truth about who you are truth about who we've been called to be we pray and ask this all in your name amen so um i don't know when it happened but at some point early in my christian walk a seemingly christian phrase entered into my theology. And that phrase was, God helps those who help themselves. It took me 10 years to figure out that actually was never a part of scripture, but in my formative years, I sincerely believe, among other things, God helps those who help themselves. Basically, I grew up believing that before God could do anything in my life, to help me, whether it was for my own salvation or whether it was whatever crisis I was going through, I had to contribute something to the pot to make it happen. And rather than that being a burdensome theology, it was actually kind of a comforting theology for me because that meant in some small way, my salvation, my success, my faith was dependent on me, it was in my own hands. I could rely on my own abilities, my own talents, my own strengths, my own passions to get me through most of life. God helps those who help themselves, so I was definitely able to help myself. And I still had the ultimate trump card that if all else failed, I had God in my back pocket. <laughs> and I think this phrase, God helps those who help themselves, entered into our Christian lexicon because in some small way it resonates <clears throat> with everything we know about larger society. The self-help motivational speaker industry is a multi-million dollar industry because we like to think that we can fix ourselves. There's a channel on TV called the DIY Network that teaches us to do everything from plumbing to building up our own houses we like to be able to say 
I did it myself. I didn't have to get the experts. I didn't have to get help. I did it myself. There's a stigma in this country about um, going to counseling, going for psychiatric help, because it means, at its most base level, we have to admit our own frailty, our own inability to solve it ourselves. We live in a society where being independent, being self-sufficient, being self-reliant, that's a sign of strength. While needing any sort of help, that's a potential sign of weakness. We approach our lives asking for help only in case of emergency. And so that was exactly how I approached my prayer life growing up. It was kind of one of those break in case of emergency things. I would do everything in my own power first, everything in my own volition to make something happen. I would do 90% of the work and then go to God for that final 10% to get me over the hump. And that's exactly what I thought Psalm 130 was too. It was one of those break in case of emergency psalms, you know? A desperation psalm to be whipped out only when all your other options have failed, only when all of your other avenues have been exhausted. But as I've read and reread the psalm countless times, I have come to realize that perhaps thinking that God helps those who help themselves, that might be wrong. Perhaps it was very wise that when we started off as Harvard Church, one of the things we decided would be we would be a people who would pray together. That would be our central value. Maybe it was wise that at Harvard Church we decided very early on that prayer wasn't a break in case of emergency deal. When I was told that, the, that we'd be looking at prayer today, um, when John handed me the topic, I was immediately drawn to this psalm because I think it in many ways encapsulates why I've come to believe that prayer is not just important for our life here at the harbor, but it's integral to any sort of success in life, any success in being a child of God. And I think the psalm encapsulates the importance of why we need to pray and pray earnestly in three ways. First, I think prayer reminds us that we are always going to be in desperate need of God. The psalm starts out, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can serve you. I think this verse first resonated with me when I went through a period of heavy, heavy depression in college. The words, out of the depths, there seemed to be something desperate in those words, and it resonated with me. I think that period of life was the first time in my still relatively young life that I did not know how I was going to solve my problems. Up to that point, I'd been able to rely on my strengths. Up to then, I had been able to dig myself out of my own holes. For the first time, though, I had no answers. When I was depressed, one of the things that um, I had extreme difficulty in was reading. And I love reading and has been, you know, the ability to read and the ability to learn have been one of the strengths that I've always leaned back on. But I couldn't read. I couldn't follow the sentence on the page. The thing that I got, that I used to get through most of life and out of most of my messes had been taken away from me. There was no easy fix to my solution. And no matter how hard I, I tried, the problem only got worse. And it got to the point where I couldn't find the strength to kick the covers off my bed in the morning. And it was at the height of my absolute uselessness as a person that I stumbled upon this psalm. Out of the depths, I cry to you. And in that uselessness, as I cried out to God, it became clear that God kind of smacked me in the head. God doesn't help those who help themselves. 
He helps those who are willing to desperately fall on their knees and cry out to Him. The walk of faith is a radical and desperate dependence on God. The story of Harvard Church has kind of been exactly that. Um, John was telling me how he started praying in this church, and he said that you know when he started, he listed out a whole bunch of things that needed to be done in the church. You know, we needed a uh, hospitality ministry, we needed a music ministry, and he sent out an email to the people who were um, there at the time and said, you know, we need people to step up for each of these roles, and no one responded except for Susie. And she wrote back and she said, I'm not going to do any of the things on your list. <laughs> but I will be willing to help lead us in prayer. And I truly believe that was an act of divine intervention on our part. That was an act of divine intervention in the life of the church. Because through every step we've taken as this small church, frail church, from meeting in the house to meeting at a pizza parlor, to moving to this building, to setting up a preschool, to setting up a Sunday school, to venturing out into the world, we have been faced with so many moments, both personally and as a body, when we have no idea what we're supposed to do, and we're stumped as to what to do, and what a blessing it has been then, that at the heart of everything we do here at the harbor is a commitment to pray to God for our help, for our salvation. The most consistent thing we do at Harbor is we spend some time every Sunday, we bring our needs and our worries to the Lord and we lift them up as prayer. I think this more than anything else has kept us through the trials. This has kept us going. The fact that our church is centered on prayer is perhaps the reason we still exist today. But prayer is a really easy thing to do when we're desperate. It's easy to see the miracles that God needs to do to save me when you're staring me right in the face, when the crisis is staring me right in the face. During moments when everything is falling apart, it's easy and almost natural to look to the heavens for help. But when I was depressed and wholly reliant on God to simply get me through each day, I began to realize that all my life, I had called upon God to rescue me out of crisis, just so that I could then get on with my life in a much more self-reliant way. I realized that I had made God my backup plan. My default was still to assume that I could solve most of my problems on my own, and I did not need to be so needless, hopelessly dependent on God. And I think at the harbor, we sometimes can run that risk too. It's easy to be a church wholly devoted to prayer when we're in crisis. But God calls us to remember that we are to be desperately in need of Him in all seasons. And I think the psalmist in Psalm 130 says it best why we need to be. He says, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? We gather here as a body of believers, not because we have it all together. We come here precisely because we know how messed up we are. We know how much we need God. In Romans, Paul reminds us, all have sinned. Every single one of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory. God. He reminds us that not one of us can be considered righteous. Each and every one of us is here because we have a deep and fatal flaw. We are all sinful. We are all broken. We are all on our own, hopelessly lost, and hopelessly unable to save ourselves. And so that's why we pray. That's why we pray. Because without God, we're hopeless. We pray to remind ourselves that it's only by grace that we have been saved and only by grace that we are who we are. It is only because of the work of God who sent His only Son to die and forgive us our sins that we stand here in His presence. 
We pray because the world out there is going to do everything it can to make us forget that fact. And to think that we can be independent, we can be self-sufficient, and we can be autonomous masters of our fate and captains of our soul. We pray to remind ourselves that's a bold-faced lie. We pray to remind ourselves that the key to our flourishing, the key to any success we're going to have in this life comes not from seeking to be independent, but from a radical dependence on God for our strength and our salvation. If God does not help us, we are lost. And so, it is not weakness to lean on the grace of God for every aspect of our life. Rather, it's our greatest strength. So first, we, prayer reminds us of our desperate need for God. But prayer is also important because it reminds us that God is the one who is in control, not us. In verse 5 and 6, the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. I don't know about you, but I have extreme difficulty waiting for anything. <laughs> if my cell phone is too slow, I want to chuck it against the wall. <laughs> I have a hard time waiting for anything, let alone God. Because waiting seems like such a powerless position to take. When we pray, we're allowing God to take control of our situation. We are intentionally lifting up our needs and taking it out of our own hands. By definition, the act of praying is talking to God and then waiting for Him to respond. And this rubs against everything the world tells us to do. The solution to problems is supposed to be more action, more strategies, harder work, more knowledge. To sit and wait seems like such an inefficient and useless thing to do. And I experienced that uselessness firsthand this week when Jana had a final classes exam, where she would be examined by close to 40 other pastors. And let me tell you, pastors before have told, her, told me in the entire ordination process, Nothing is more intimidating than this one thing. And as Jana's husband, I couldn't help but feel it was completely useless in helping her out. But I was still busy running Helter Skelter, trying to get the worship space ready, trying to get the food prepared, get all the tables set up. And I realized I was doing this because I was trying to do everything I could to get Jana over the finish line. I realized I was just running around, but there was, at the end of the day, absolutely nothing I could do to make Jana pass this test, except to pray and to wait. And instead of that being a moment of hopelessness, I think that's exactly where the Lord met me. Because that, the moment I handed it all off to God and said, it's out of my hands, there was a peace that passed over me. An assurance that God was in control of this whole situation. And you, Jeremy, are most definitely not. <laughs> I realized once again that what I was trying to do all day was try and wrest control away from God and you know, make all the circumstances perfect so that it would line up to get the result I wanted. And I was convicted that by the fact that in my desperation to do all that, I had stopped trusting God and I had stopped listening to Him. I think we're simply just wired to be control freaks. I think that's just who we are. We're wired to be control freaks and wired to try and wrest control out of God's hands. This is exactly what drove Adam and Eve to disobey God in the first place, to take that fruit they ate the fruit because they didn't trust God to sustain them. They didn't trust God to take care of them. They wanted to take matters into their own hands. 
And I think this primordial sin drives so much of our lives today. In times of crisis, in moments great and small, our instinct is to try and rely on our own resources first. Our trust in God only goes so far as our eyes can see, or until we have no other option but to trust Him. But I truly believe that God gives us this gift of prayer to remind us each and every day that we are not our own. We belong, body and soul, to our Lord, and He is in control. And we will find our peace only when we give up our control and wait for Him. It's no coincidence as I was reading this week, that I found that the ministry of Jesus Christ is littered with prayer. In Luke 5, verse 6, it says, He often withdrew from the crowds to another place because he went off to pray. In Mark, we see that he was often found alone in the mornings in prayer, and the disciples had to find him. He prayed at his baptism. He prayed before he chose his disciples. He prayed before setting out on his mission in the first place. He prayed when he healed people, when he fed the 5,000 before the transfiguration, before his death, and on the cross. But it struck me that of all the people who have ever existed in the entire world, wouldn't Jesus Christ be the person who needed to pray to his Father the least? After all, this is the Son of God who is more holy, more powerful and more good than anyone else. This is the Son of God who is closer to the Father than any of us will ever be on this earth, and yet such important work to do. Surely, you know, praying might be taking up too much time from this limited mission that He had for us. I couldn't understand why Jesus needed to pray. But that's when I found in John 5 verse 17 Jesus was speaking to the crowds and he said the son cannot do anything by himself he only does what he sees the father doing to Jesus Christ son of the living God prayer was not just something nice to do while he was ministering to us but it was the essential key to his whole life and his whole ministry. It was only in spending the seemingly inefficient time of prayer that he could know what the Father was doing and thus follow after him and thus save us. So I guess it follows that if even Jesus, Son of God, he knew his success hinged on knowing the will of God who is control. How much more do we need to be doing the same thing? And he taught us how to pray and how poignant that the first thing he asked us to pray after our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It is truly only when we wait, when we allow God to take control, that we find our peace. It's only when we stop trying to help God solve his own problems that God can show us the way we're supposed to go. So we've seen that the psalmist shows us that the reason we pray is to remind ourselves that first we radically need God and cannot possibly go through life without him. But second, we pray because he is in control of every situation when we wait on him. But I think finally, prayer reminds us that the reason we do this is because we can put our hope in God to deliver us and lead us to redemption. At the end, in verse 7, it says, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, with Him full redemption. He Himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. And I think this is the very heart of prayer. It is the in intentional act of throwing every ounce of our trust and our hope in God and God alone to rescue and deliver and change and redeem and renew us. 
We put our hope in God because He is the only one who is sure and trustworthy. He's the only one worthy of putting our hope in. Every other thing we're going to try and put our hope in is going to, at some point, fail us. But the Lord will never fail us. Our leaders will fail us. Our country will fail us. Our mentors, our justice system, our intellect, our skills will someday fail us. Our jobs, our families, our friends, our pets, our spouses, our children, they will ultimately all let us down. But the psalmist asked us to put our hope in God because it is only in God's unfailing love and full redemption that we find satisfaction. And the thing about hoping in the Lord is we're not hoping in hypotheticals. We don't hope for the Lord like, I hope it still stays sunny today. We hope in what we know is already true. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, who we know came down as a man, lived among us, breathed out air, and broke bread in with us. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, who healed the sick, cured all diseases, fed the hungry, raised the dead. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, who willingly died for our sins, rose again to free us from the power of sin and death. Our hope is in a God who will come back to eradicate evil once and for all, to redeem us and make us whole and give us eternal life. Our hope is in a God who promised us the Holy Spirit to empower us to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Our hope is in a God who is greater than our fears, stronger than our weaknesses, and who has overcome the darkness. Our hope is in a God who is for us, and who shall stand against? Whom shall we fear? And this is why we pray. We pray because the world is going to do everything in his power to make us forget that this is true. The devil is going to spin every lie possible to make us doubt our God who saves. We're going to be tempted in every way to compromise, to settle for less, to give up on the hope we have in the Lord. So that's why we pray. <coughs> so we never forget the God who made a way for us. We never forget the Holy Spirit who lives in us. We never forget that he has empowered us for his service. He has lifted us up out of our graves. We pray so that we can step out like Jesus did without fear, but with boldness, to proclaim to a broken world that he is mighty to save. We pray because we remember that he is a God who can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to the power of God within us. And we pray because we know that the more we pray, the more we will know how wide long and deep and wide is the unfailing love of Christ. So Harvard Church, the question is as we move forward, will we claim prayer as our central values? Are we willing to be needy and radically dependent on our Heavenly Father, or will we instead choose to lean on our own strengths? Will we be willing to wait upon him and let him be in control of this church in our lives? Or will we, will we be a church that tries to do his job? Are we willing to be led where he will lead us, even if that's not where we prefer to go? Or will we be a church that only goes so far as we are comfortable? Are we willing to put our trust and our hope in God and God alone to supply our needs? and shape us into the people he's called us to be. I sincerely hope so. So before we close, I want us all, we've been talking about prayer all day, and I want us all to just take a minute and let's just exactly do that. Let's pray right now. I invite you where you are to pray for your own faith, for this church, and if you need to confess like I need to do, 
that praying has been something I've neglected or I could do much better at. I invite you to do well that as well. So we'll just take a few minutes in silence and then we'll close with the prayer that our Lord taught us again. And then we'll sing. So let's do that now. Will you pray with me? Now say with me, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 